Gurudev gave many different types of satsangs. Some of them would be very practical. Some of them would be totally devotional. And then occasionally you would get a satsang like that, which for me was absolutely breathtaking. It's like he stands on the threshold between two planes, between the physical world that we all dwell in, the phenomenal plane of duality, and the absolute, the truth. Bold, clear, naked truth. And standing on that threshold, it's like he opens a portal, a gateway, in which we can get a glimpse of what that is like, what that would feel like what it would look like. Total freedom of all fear, sorrow, delusion, supreme peace and joy. And all that separates us is this thin little crust of ego. We're doing uh, a practice that we began this, this month, and is going to go for the full year in which we go through the different precepts of what are called yama and niyama, the ethical foundation of yoga. So I met with my group the other day, and we were discussing what we want to do for the month. What do we want to do? What do we want to practice in the name of ahimsa, nonviolence, is what we were discussing. And I'll just share with you, it was a very deeply moving and personal moment for me. I felt like I was almost like this little chick inside. And the person I meant to be the person I was born to be and express in this life is like a little chick inside this shell. And nature, people, experiences, whatever, give little chips at that shell. And at the same time, I'm there in the inside going, trying to get out. Do you know what I'm describing? Does it, do you have a feel for that? It's like sensing completely the fullness of who you are and the perfection that God created in your little form just wanting to break free and express without all the self-imposed limitations that we call the ego. All our attachments, our fears, our false identifications, basically, that limit the fullness, the power, the grace, the presence of who we truly are and are meant to express and manifest on this earthly plane. So when he spoke about it like piercing the shell, it really resonated with my heart. So, hmm. Did anyone else have that sort of feeling watching this satsang? That it was like being face to face with the truth in its stark, unadorned, unembellished reality and calling us to drop all that keeps us from experiencing that, not in little glimpses, but every moment in the fullness of our existence. Anyway, that's what I got from that satsang. And it's quite daunting being up here 
after that. Okay. Questions about the guru. Can a person have more than one guru? Must a guru be an enlightened person? We have lots of gurus as we go through life. In the Hindu tradition, they say there are four main gurus, Mata, Pita, Guru, and Deva, the four gurus. The first guru is the mother. The baby's first guru is the mother. She's the one that is the baby's support, sustenance, protector, guardian in life. She introduces the baby to Pita, the father. The father, when it is time, takes on the training, the education of the child. When the child grows even more, the father brings the child, in traditional culture, to the guru, the spiritual guide. But it doesn't stop with the physical guru. The guru's goal is to take that soul to the fullness of the experience of God. For the little salt doll to become one with the ocean. So anyone who teaches us anything is a guru. Guru consists of two words, gu and ru. Gu means what it sounds like. All the goo, all the gunk that's getting in the way physically and mentally from our being able to experience the truth, the fullness of who we are. Ru means remover. So anyone who removes our ignorance about anything is a guru of sorts. We say upaguru, someone who teaches us something in particular. We can have a cooking guru, a maintenance guru, a car repair guru, all sorts of gurus in our life. Normally, when we say guru, we speak of someone who is equipped to point the way and guide us to the absolute truth, the absolute reality. So in that sense, an enlightened master is the ultimate guru. Sometimes we have that physical presence in our lives. Sometimes we can connect with the spirit of the guru. And sometimes what often happens is those who are a little more advanced along the way serve as guides to those who are progressing along the way. I always think of the Sangha like a family. Just like in a family, the older children help the younger children on the spiritual path, the same happens. Those who have developed a bit more are there to support and guide those newly coming who in turn will guide those who come after them. God gives us what we need at the exact moment. So one shouldn't feel deprived or lacking if they don't get up every day and go sit at the feet of a physical realized master. The master in the form of everyone, everything, and the universe is there to teach us every moment. If we have the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and a heart that's open. One of my favorite saints is a French mystic named Cossade. And he wrote a book called Abandonment to Divine Providence that Gurudev told some of us to read many years ago. He's an interesting person in that he combines the Buddhist approach of being in the moment with Christian devotion to the divine. But he used to say, 
every single moment, God is communicating itself to us in truth. God comes disguised as all the people, situations, and circumstances in our lives. But very often, we don't like what's happening in our lives. And so we reject the truth as it's manifesting before us and instead create our own fantasies and imaginations about what the divine is. So if you have faith, you know without any doubt that what you need, the guidance, the comfort, the support, and the withdrawal of that as well will happen at the perfect moment to mold us, guide us, make us utterly fit for that highest experience. Dear Swami Karunananda, I never met Swami Sachidananda, but I love his teachings and feel that his teachings are my guru. Can a guru's teachings be my guru instead of the guru as a person, or is it all the same thing? Thank you. Gurudev used to say, the man in the orange robe with the long beard is not the guru. The guru is the teaching. The guru is the embodiment of the teaching. The guru embodies the teaching, points the way to the teaching. He once told a story comparing the guru to a signpost. He said, let's say you want to go to New York, and you come upon a signpost that points in a certain direction, indicating you have to walk 50 miles in that direction to reach New York. What would be the most efficacious way to go to New York? To stand by the signpost? bow and go, oh, worshipful signpost, thank you so much for all your wisdom and guidance. Then you get all sorts of worshipful things, and you offer it to the signpost, flowers and milk and honey, and you circumambulate the signpost, <laughs> and you never walk. Are you going to get to New York? So the idea here is not not to worship and show your gratitude and your reverence and your respect, but don't stop there. Follow the teachings. That is what will get you to the goal. Your worship, your reverence, your gratitude will open you to receive the guidance of the universal guru and the guru as that person manifested through a particular beloved form. Early on on my journey, this was in the 70s, I was living at our San Francisco IYI, and we had an ashram in Santa Barbara which is about a six-hour drive away. And we also purchased a winter home for Gurudev there. So every weekend, those of us from the San Francisco IYI used to drive down to Santa Barbara for satsang with Gurudev. And then we'd get up the next day and drive right back. We try to do that as frequently as possible. OK? So I lived in San Francisco, would go to see Gurudev, but wouldn't see him all that regularly, maybe once a week for an hour. OK? After some time, I was transferred to our Santa Barbara ashram. So I saw him and interacted with him much more frequently. At the San Francisco IYI, we had a very strong sadhana together, a very strong practice, very strong service. We would literally get up at 4 AM, because we followed Master Shivananda's song, get up at 4 AM, do Ram Ram, 
repeat shop, but we'd get up at 4, we'd meditate from 4.30 to 6.15, we would do our hatha yoga to 8.30, we'd have a meeting, a little breakfast, and do our service. We'd meditate at noon, our final meditation was 9 to 9.30 at night, 10 o'clock would be lights out, and this was seven days a week. No answering machines, no day off, a total immersion in sadhana and service. Now, the Santa Barbara IYI ashram was more of a pioneer community. We had a 65-acre avocado ranch, and things were a little looser, to say the least. They were a lot looser, in a way. At one point, to give you an example, I served as treasurer and one particular month, we got an extremely high water bill. And we were wondering, what is the source of this water bill going so high? Some of the members of the ashram for their service would walk the line every day to see the irrigation system. And one day, they came back and announced to us that we had a new lake on the property turned out it wasn't a new creek, it was a leak. But we had never noticed it. So the reason I'm telling you this story is to illustrate the focus and the clarity and the discernment were not quite the same. The point of this story is, though, when I lived, lived at the San Francisco IYI, I felt Gurudev's presence with me every moment in every action, in every thought, in every word, in every deed. It was a part of what we breathed in and breathed out because we lived so much in alignment, literally 24-7 with those teachings. When I moved to Santa Barbara, even though I physically had much more contact with him, worked with him, saw him, I didn't feel his presence as strongly or profoundly in my life. It was a great lesson. The guru's presence, the guru's spirit, the guru's guidance is always there, available to all of us. You just have to open your heart, and it's there. In integral yoga, we're asked to keep the ego as pure as crystal. How is this done? Are there specific practices? How does the pure ego function? Pure ego lets you realize that you're an instrument of a, of a higher power, a higher force. And a pure ego guides you to do everything for the benefit of others, bringing benefit to someone, harm to no one, including yourself. How to keep the ego as pure as crystal? Yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, eight limbs of raja yoga. Have a strong ethical foundation. Practice hatha yoga and pranayama to keep the body strong and flexible and clean. Practice pratyahara so you don't overload yourself, overindulge the senses. Dharana, dhyana, samadhi, learn how to focus your mind. If you do all that, the ego will be pure as a crystal. Just try to be easeful in body, peaceful in mind, lead a useful life. You'll become a beautiful temple for the divine to totally express in you and through you. Does that all make sense? Yeah? Could you tell us about when you met Swami Satchidananda for the first time. Thank you. Wow, 
I think if you asked any of the senior people, they'd all have an interesting story to tell you. The first time I met him was simply hearing his name. A friend called me to tell me that a Swami was coming to the college campus and that they were going to see him. And I got this funny feeling when I heard that. And I said, what's the Swami's name? And he said, well, the name of the Swami is Swami Sachidananda. And literally, I stopped breathing. I think my heart stopped beating for a few moments. I hung up the phone. And to be perfectly honest, I said, oh, no. <laughs> Life as I have known it is over. I just had this sense that life as I had known it was over, that something momentous was going to occur. Physically, that was in April of 1970. I didn't meet him till the following September. I didn't physically meet him till then. And I'll tell you, this is a little bit of a miracle story that we don't share that often, but this was the first time I actually saw him. I was on a bus outside the San Francisco IYI, waiting to leave for our first retreat with him in California. If you've ever been to the San Francisco IYI, anyone here ever been there? It's a beautiful Victorian mansion, four stories, very high off the street. So I'm waiting on the bus with a bunch of other eager, clueless seekers. And he had just had a meeting with the people who lived in the IYI. And he came out the front door. And he was way above street level with them ready to go to his car to go to the retreat, which was in Santa Cruz. So he's all the way up there. And I'm all the way ground level. And the next moment, I see his face right outside the window looking into my eyes, peering deeply into my eyes. And then I see him looking into each window going down the bus. And not too long ago, someone else who was on that bus shared with me that they had the exact same experience. So it wasn't simply my imagination. So I felt like he was just checking out who we all were, in essence, looking at the work that was being laid before him. And then the bus pulled out. And the best way I can describe it is my mind went berserk. It was like this ball of energy confined within my skull, rushing in every way possible, probably trying to escape. <laughs> because I think, again, to be totally honest, on some very deep, subtle level, my mind, or in other words, the lower mind, recognized it had met its master. And as when I heard his name months prior, it knew for certain it was confirmed that life as I had known it would never be the same again. And then on the retreat, every morning and evening, he came and lectured on Raja Yoga, the teachings of Patanjali. When he spoke, I cried. It was like something that had been barren, arid, in the deepest recesses of my heart 
for eons was finally being watered again. And by the end of that retreat, I knew that he had within him what I was longing for, fulfilled in him, embodied in him, were the peace, the fullness of love, the absolute steadfastness and steadiness, and the overwhelming compassion that my own heart wished to dwell in. So I decided from that day forward to do my best to follow his teachings and see where it led. And here we all are today. So I think maybe one more. Let's see. Well, this is a tough one. OK. I struggle with the concept of God being all-pervading consciousness that is neutral. The analogy often mentioned is that it is like electricity, neither good nor bad. Is God neutral or is God good? Thank you for answering my question. Tough question, huh? It's like this is a corollary to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? If God is good, why would that happen? Why is there evil in the world? Isn't God more powerful than evil? There are a lot of seeming paradoxes that can present to the limited understanding of our mind. God is the all-pervading power and consciousness of the universe. As such, it embraces everyone and everything. Swami Satchidananda used to compare the universe to a university. It's here to teach us lessons so we can grow and unfold into the perfection of that divine presence within us. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? God is the absolute consciousness. God expresses as the entire creation. OK? God's will is expressed through nature's law. The law of nature is the law of karma, the law of cause and effect. If you do something good, pleasurable experiences come. If you do something harmful, painful experiences come. We're placed in this huge classroom where we learn, grow, and evolve, and then experience the fullness of the absolute. I'll give you one more analogy that maybe will help make this a little more clear. Sometimes we see very bad things happen, what we can call evil in the world. If we have an understanding of God limited to only accepting or loving those who are good and obedient, then how would we explain where this other came from since everything was created by the divine? God gives us the freedom and the opportunity to make choices, learn, and evolve. 
What has helped me a lot when faced with those sorts of situations in the world, of which there seem to be all too many, is to think of those sorts of situations and behaviors like more like baby souls that have yet to learn all the lessons and evolve and grow and know better. Imagine you have a baby, OK? And the baby does what babies do. It defecates all over the crib. And it doesn't stop there. It picks it up. It rubs it all over, because it has this new thing to play with, this stuff that appeared in the crib. Then he takes it, he rubs it all over the wall, OK? You come into the baby's nursery, and you look at the mess. And what do you do? Do you go, bad baby, <laughs> evil baby. <laughs> I hate you, baby. Why did God create you, baby? Look at you. Look at what you did. No. What do you do? You go, it's a baby. It doesn't know any better. And as gently and carefully as you can, you clean it up. You clean up the mess that it has made. And over time, you guide that baby as it slowly grows. The world is like that. We're at different levels. Baby souls, children souls, adult souls, fully ripened souls. That's what. And that all-pervasive, all-compassionate, all-loving consciousness that we call God that heart loves us all, not only when we're good, not only when we're obedient, not only when we're doing the right things, even when we're naughty, even when we're mischievous, even when we make big mistakes. Never do we or can we do anything outside the pale of that love that continues to support, sustain, nurture us until in the fullness of time we grow, mature, evolve, and like the guru in the first question, become fully enlightened, shedding that light and grace on all of us so that we too can grow in that light attain that supreme perfection, dwell in peace, and then share that with the entire world. Thank you. Om Shanti.